Welcome, everybody. This is another social distance learning brought to you by the Liberal Gun Club. And tonight, Scott, otherwise known as the Bench Doctor, will be showing us how to take apart a gun you have never worked on before, uh, because that's always a fun time. This is currently being streamed out of Zoom to Twitch, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, we can't stream to YouTube because they don't like it when you handle firearms live on their streaming side of things. Uh, this will get put up on YouTube later, though. Uh, so everyone knows, all participants, but the moderators and presenter have their video shut off and are muted. If there are questions, please put them in the Discord Q&A channel or inside the Zoom chat here. We have several people watching for questions at the various locations, but the easiest way to get your question answered is to become a member and sign into Zoom so you can ask your question live in chat. Becoming a member is inexpensive. It's only about 10 bucks a year and brings other benefits with it. Feel free to join us in Discord for our usual uh, after SDL shenanigans, jokes, fun times, food comparison, alcohol uh, conversations, and so on and so forth. We call it pub chat, and I put the link to Discord in the Zoom chat. But yeah, go ahead. Take it away. All right. Well, this is all kind of a uh, – man, it's sort of a fun uh, – yeah, uh, you know, trying to be fun – but you know, somewhat informative uh, in this presentation, and it's kind of a, it's something I deal with fairly often, which is you know like how do you deal with guns that you've never seen before? Um, you know how do you how do you take them apart and diagnose problems and uh, you know work on them if you're not at all familiar with them? And uh, so I, I brought out an array of kind of ones that I've dealt with in recently that uh, are kind of interesting. And uh, one of the things that I constantly deal with is, um, wow, I didn't expect a spring to be there. And then the spring then decides to vacate the premises and you don't know, you know, like how do you make a spring you don't have a copy of? Um, so that means scouring the floor with a magnet and a shop vac and sifting through it all to try to find the spring. So I wanted to kind of talk about how to anticipate where that those places might be. It's kind of like that the old fashioned jack in the box, you know, do 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 do. You remove a screw and bing, out pops the jack in the box. So uh, this is just kind of some different guns from a period in sort of gun history that I really like, which is the early part of the 20th century when uh, everybody was trying to make semi-automatic pistols and a lot of people did. Uh, and, and, but then over time, a few designs kind of boiled to the top and, and they're, you know, most modern firearms are kind of based on those, but some of these are weird variations uh, from that period. So Anyway, I uh, figure I'll get started here and kind of explain what's going on. This is uh, an Austrian semi-automatic gun. It's a 25 caliber. And unlike, you know, most modern guns, most semi-automatics, you know, how the whole slide, you know, like this, the whole slide slides back. Um, this one doesn't work that way. It has a little pull back here. That's how you charge it. And uh, so looking at the gun, you're like, okay, I figured that out pretty quickly, but how do you take it apart? Like there's no takedown button screw, you know, none of these things work as a takedown mechanism. So it's kind of baffling, like, where do I start taking this gun apart? Um, and how does it work? Because I've never worked on <clears throat> never worked on one before. So I look at the barrel, and the barrel is the bottom. You'd think that the barrel would be the top. That's the way most are made. And then down here would be a guide rod and a recoil spring. So I anticipate there being a guide rod and a recoil spring somewhere up here. Uh, and then looking here, this is just an improvised um, guide rod for now until I can find a uh, suitable replacement, but I just machined it down to make it work and uh, get the gun working and then I'll figure out how to make a new one. But anyway, so, and I didn't really find much information on this thing. Um, you know, there's some minor write-ups about the gun itself, but not much about how to take it apart. So it was kind of a interesting challenge. So I figured up here, there's a screw wasn't sure what it did, but I thought, well, they wouldn't put it there for no reason. So I uh, 
started unscrewing things. And, you know, this is kind of an approach that sometimes you just need to step out and take a risk. And one thing that, you know, with modern cell phones, it's great because you can take pictures of things, um, you know, how they were uh, before you took it apart and completely lost yourself in the design and what to do. And uh, so, you know, that's an invaluable tool. Uh, when I started this stuff, we didn't have digital cameras. Um, so sometimes you would maybe on a really expensive gun take you know, film pictures, uh, but, you know, it took three or four days to get them developed. Uh, so sometimes you draw a kind of a crude picture as to how things were oriented um, and do it that way. So I'm taking, just taking the, the scales off and you'll notice here, like we're so used to this area being open on a gun um, that, you know, there, it, this gun was full of all kinds of neat surprises. Uh, it's kind of really why I like this period in gun design. Another thing to, to, that's really important here is to keep track of parts and where they go because fasteners uh, are easy to lose, you know, screws and things like that. It's easy to misplace them or not remember where they go on the gun because they could be of very close to exact, exactly the same, but they're not. So it's a good idea to take pictures and label things if you have any doubt at all. So once I got this off, you could see that this plate, you know, I looked and there's a really faint outline where this plate, let me see if I can get close enough to show you, but this is a separate plate and there's a line here and it kind of comes up here, uh, you know, kind of like the plate on a revolver, like a um, Smith & Wesson or a Colt revolver. So this plate comes off, um, but it looks like you have to get the slide out of the way to remove that. So after much head scratching, I figured this screw is really the key to getting the uh, slide off. So I gingerly unscrewed it and uh, wasn't sure what was going to happen. It's just a little tiny screw. And you know, at that point, nothing really happened. So I was kind of perplexed. And then I realized the safety comes out so I took that out, pulled the slide back. Okay, and there it opens up this way. I was expecting it to pull back or go forward off of the rails like a modern gun, but that's not what happens. It opens like a stapler. So that was kind of unexpected. And then this, the bolt and the bolt carrier just kind of slide right off the top. And I... Uh, Looking at it, and this gun was interesting to me because it had, rather than a pin, it has a little tiny screw right there uh, that holds your uh, your extractor. And uh, there's another little tiny screw here. Um, and then this is where, uh, where the guide rod kind of connects. So when you charge the gun, this is where it's happening right here. Uh, but, it, it, you know, these, these guns from this period are so intricately made that you probably couldn't manufacture one today. You'll notice that the uh, bolt carrier here is serialized with the serial number of the gun as well. Um, and, you know, here's your extractor and here's your uh, uh, ejector. And they're just I thought it was neat that they're both held in by these tiny little screws. These are the kind of screws that you're just waiting for the surprise spring to pop out of when you remove them, um, you know, because you know that this piece is spring loaded. You can see it. So, you know, when you're removing that screw, keep your hand, you know, keep that thing, uh, your hand kind of covering or, or keeping a little bit of tension on it so that this doesn't go flying across the room when you remove that screw. Uh, these are all lessons learned the hard way. So, you know, you'd back that screw out and then gently let the pressure off and take the screw in, or I mean, the uh, uh, ejector and the screw or the spring out of there and then label them maybe on just on a post-it note and set them on the post-it note as to what they are. And, you know, sometimes the orientation will confuse you. Like, which way did this go back in there? Was the rounded part in or out? And it will become more obvious as you put things back together because things just don't fit. But don't get 
upset if you take things apart three, four times to try to figure it out. Um, that's really common with these things. But the nice thing about them is, um, you know, you can just set it down and walk away. Uh, you know, if you get frustrated or angry with it. Uh, and then, you know, here, you know, there's another spring because the firing pin, you know, uh, the, the hammer hits that firing pin. So, you know, there's a spring in there. Uh, so, you know, carefully remove that. And, uh, you know, so those are the kind of things that you have to anticipate. If you feel like any kind of spring tension on something, you know that you're going to have to be careful uh, taking it apart. And one suggestion that I used to use on ARs before I got a little more experience with working on them is to get a gallon uh, Ziploc bag, put the whole assembly in a bag and do it through the plastic where you can see what you're doing. But if something launches, there's a good chance you're going to catch it. Um, so that's that's one trick. But anyway, so that's that's two areas where I would expect uh, a potential spring in the face. I'm going to go ahead and set those aside. And uh, so from here, I can remove the magazine. It's got the heel release, uh, which interestingly, this one pushes forward. It goes this way as opposed to back like most of them. Uh, so I push forward, slide the magazine out. And uh, you can see it's not loaded. Um, now this plate slides right off. Um, you know this, and really neat, like this jeweled finish on the outside of this plate or the inside of this plate will never be seen unless you're taking the gun apart. But they went to the trouble of jeweling that. You know, it's just a it just you imagine what an expense and what a time suck that would have been to sit there and jewel a part that nobody's ever gonna see. Same with the inside of the magwell, that's all jeweled. I mean, it looks beautiful, um, but has no purpose. So here's an area where I would pay special attention to how things go together. I would take a picture of this before I pulled it apart. And you have these two posts um, and you have your, uh, you know, your sear and hammer and all these pieces. And you want to remember the orientation uh, because it is easy to get things in upside down or backward and then get really frustrated trying to get the gun to work. So take pictures uh, every step of the way. And uh, this, this would be an area where I would take a picture because unless you can find a, a uh, diagram or a schematic of uh, how these guns go together. And then from here, I can take this front screw out and take the whole slide off. And this gun was non-working when I got it. Um, there had been, uh, somebody had uh, cobbled together a uh, guide rod and uh, return spring for this thing that just kind of had ripped itself apart. So I had to cobble together a new one uh, and play around with it until I got it to work. Um, but now I need to make a new guide rod which now that I understand the whole thing, shouldn't be too much of a problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this front slide assembly off and kind of take that apart and show you how it looks. So, you know, notice here that it's just, it's just rocking back and forth. I don't feel any spring tension and I wouldn't expect a spring to be in this situation, but you never know, people did weird things, um, but take this out. And be really careful taking these old screws out because you're never going to find another one. You may end up having to make one. Uh, and sometimes these old screws have weird thread patterns that you can't find a tap or a die for. So be real careful taking stuff apart. And you can see that one just is only threaded on the very bottom. There's like four threads on there. So then this kind of just comes apart like that. So that's the slide. And there's not much in here uh, other than the guide rod. And this piece right here, that little round part is what made up to this oval shape in the, in the uh, bolt. So it kind of, let's see if I can, kind of goes like that. So when you pull this back, it's pulling the, uh, the, uh, 
pulling on that guide rod spring and then it locks in place, uh, you know, the seer catches it. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that out. You can see that there's just this kind of stainless steel um, screw in there. Uh, and that's the only screw I had in the shop that was long enough for this purpose. So I used it just experimenting. So now I need to figure out a way to replace it with, uh, it would be a slotted screw, it looks like from the examples that I've seen. So what I'm gonna do is unscrew this. Uh, let me grab a Phillips. You, you'll know it's, you know what's wrong because Phillips screws are rarely if ever used on guns. Um, they just, you just never see them. They're either like Allen, Torx bits, uh, slotted, but they're never, never Phillips. So I'm slowly taking this out because I know this thing's under spring pressure. So there's, you know, it could be pushing back on that spring and I don't want it to launch. Uh, but as I take this out, it's, you know, you can see that just kind of sprung forward. Um, so this is all it is, is this long screw. On the original, what had happened is, uh, get this piece out. They had uh, just forced a screw in there. Um, and when I cocked the gun and tried to fire it, the screw ripped out and just the threads were all flattened down and crushed from trying to force it in with the wrong thread pitch. Uh, fortunately, I was able to take it apart and uh, kind of salvage those threads. I did have a uh, tap that fit those threads. So I was able to chase the threads and clean them up enough for this screw. It's a, uh, I think it's size eight by 32 thread. And it's not an uncommon size, you know, uh, thread count. So it should be okay to uh, either find something suitable or make something suitable. So the way this would normally be would be, um, it, it would look just like this, but it would be a little bit thicker and it would have a slot in it. So I'm going to probably end up having to make one, but that's not a big deal. You just cut a, a, a piece of steel round stock down to this size and then uh, to the max size for the, the tap and die and then just thread it. But so, you know, those are the pieces. Um, I'm not going to take the gun down any further. I just wanted to kind of show you the latest example of things that always uh, that that I run into with kind of taking apart old guns. So I'm gonna go ahead and set that aside. I'll put it together in a little bit. Um, but one of the things that's uh, really interesting, like I just got this one. It's a um, uh, HN 10 slash 22. It's based on the, uh, or I mean, I'm sorry, FN. It's based on the FN 1910 model, but it was made in 1922. It was made longer, uh, you know, in the barrel and longer, you know, in the frame to be able to take a larger magazine. Uh, I had never seen one before. And so I was really curious as to how you get this thing apart. And um, I suspected it, you know, I, I did a little bit of looking around and the gun is a, mo uh, is a, a browning mo um, gun, you know, it's a browning design. So that gave me some clues as to how this thing probably came apart uh, based on Browning and the era, because this is also a Browning design and from near the same period. So, you know, this is a 1908 vest pocket. So I figured, well, there's got to be some similarities to the way these guns would come apart. So. I know you can get YouTube videos and you can look up YouTube videos and see people do this, but I like to try to figure it out on my own if I can, and then go look at a video. Sorry, just getting a drink of water. That is not alcohol. Um, so I, I always like to try to figure it out myself uh, and then maybe go to a video if, uh, for last resort. So anyway, I looked at this and this reminds me also of another gun that I have that uh, was also kind of the same period, similar design, which is a MAB pistol from World War II made by the French for the Germans. So there were some similarities there. So I had some idea of how this thing should probably work. So I noticed the first thing is this barrel extension. I don't know if it's coming through on the video, but there's a little 
serrated piece that's spring loaded that goes forward. And this is an extension to the barrel. I mean, to the frame, the barrel, it's obviously not connected to the barrel, but so I figured this barrel extension had to come off uh, as part of the disassembly process, which made me think that this is probably like a lot of Browning designs from that period where the bolt rotates uh, and fits in some slots inside the frame. So I, I had a pretty good idea. That's how this gun came apart. So the first thing I, you have to do is you have to push this little uh, spring loaded thing forward and let me get it started and then turn it to unscrew it. Kind of sorry if I'm blocking the camera, it's just an awkward thing. So see that screws off like so. Now I know that thing's under spring pressure and it's tiny. You know, I know that's going to be a small spring. So I cover it with my hands like this before I take that off because I know something's gonna come out of there. And sure enough, right here is a little tiny plunger and a little tiny spring. And you might have to back up with your hand a little bit closer to the table because it's mm -hmm. getting very blurry when you bring it too close yeah. to the camera. So anyway, there's just a little tiny spring and a little tiny plunger. And I had a feeling that they were in there and not captured. So be careful, you know, you saw me put both hands over it and ease it apart. Um, so that comes off and then you have your recoil spring that just goes around the barrel. That's another clue that it uh, is a, a Browning design and another, you know, the, the more you work on similar guns, you start to pick up the design cues as to, you know, how to disassemble them. So this just slides right off. And this is exactly like the MAB works the same way. So this slides off. Get that part out of here since it's okay. So now you know we have the the spring off and the but the slide isn't going anywhere. So the first thing I did was I started trying to rotate the barrel, which is how a lot of these Browning designs come apart. But I couldn't find where the not where the the cuts in the frame lined up with what I suspected were going to be the uh, risers on the barrel. I just couldn't find that sweet spot. And if anybody's familiar with these, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, you you kind of rotate the barrel, it lines up, that spins and the whole thing comes apart. Uh, so what I figured out is you have to slide it all the way back and lock the slide. Let's see, right? You have to kind of lock it back and then you can rotate the barrel. So I'm rotating it. Now it turns. Once it starts to turn a whole revolution, it comes apart just like that. Uh, but it took me a few minutes to kind of figure it out. Like, why didn't this just free spin like it does on other guns of the same design? So there, now my barrel is free and I can slide it out. Uh, let's see here, like so. And so what I'm talking about are these uh, raised bridges right here lock into, um, I can find them on the slide, uh, right in here, there's a lug that those spin into and lock in place. Um, and this is an old striker fired gun, which is kind of neat, um, you know, cause a lot of people think that a uh, striker fired gun is something new to like, you know, Glock or, uh, you know, other, other more modern guns, but that's not true. So this is the firing mechanism. This is your, your uh, firing pin. This is a little notch that the sear grabs onto. This is a spring. And then this is a little loaded chamber indicator here on the back, which is also not a brand new revelation to people that the, the loaded chamber indicator has been around for you know 100 years so that just slides out be careful uh because sometimes what will happen in this style of gun is this spring will not come off with a slide and it will be loaded under tension and this will be locked into the sear um and if you bump it it will go flying it just turns this firing pin into a little rocket um and the spring also goes flying with it, which is a huge pain. Uh, and I've learned the hard way that if you're going to do that, if you're stuck in that position, put your hand over it like this and then kind of move it off of the um, sear so it doesn't 
come apart because I have spent countless hours looking for those components on various guns and they're not interchangeable. I mean, you could probably manufacture one, make one, but you'd have to know the dimensions of it. And it would take you a while to reverse engineer it to get uh, the geometry of this down properly, the length of the pin, you know, this flat spot, it would just take you a long time to try to figure out how to recreate that thing. So uh, be careful when you see them. I'll, I'll take apart my um, uh, little Colt and I'll show you what I'm talking about. This one is just has so much spring tension that it's kind of a pain to set it up that way. So that's something else to look for in these old striker fired guns is that, that, spring to be loaded up so um and then of course you have your uh scales being held on with one screw and nothing complicated about this and i've never really run into much of a problem removing the the grips or scales on one of these you know on an old handgun but there's probably one out there that's spring loaded somewhere and it's going to surprise me um so you know there's the frame and now you can from here you can take a picture of this uh assembly as to how it goes together and knock the pins out and put it back together you'll notice that there's a little spring down in here uh so you might you know you take a quick look and see where the springs are so you can kind of anticipate where you might be running into some trouble. We know that this is a uh, grip safety right here, like a 1911, another kind of John Browning feature. So uh, probably taking this pin out, I haven't taken this gun completely down yet, um, but taking this pin out, we know that there's something that spring loads that. I would imagine it's a big long flat spring, like a 1911, I would guess, which isn't a big deal. They just kind of fall right out. Um, and they're, they're not prone to, you know, ejecting parts and themselves all over the place, but that's what I suspect is down in there. Uh, so that's how you, that's how I took this thing apart and kind of how I figured it out. Um, beautiful old gun. I suspect that it was reblued at some point though, because it's in such incredible shape. Uh, whoever did it, did a, uh, great job of rebluing this thing because all of the roll marks are really crisp they and they didn't round off all of these rough edges you know are these really square edges a lot of times if they reblew it all of this stuff will be kind of rolled over um, but they managed to sand this thing down and and save all of that uh, which is really the trick to refinishing a gun is to to kind of do that without screwing it up but what you know what i noticed the biggest telltale indicator that the gun had been reblued is if you look at the magazine there are some pits uh you know all along the the body of the magazine but they're blued over so somebody sanded this down as much as they thought they could and didn't fill the pits and just reblued it but uh the only way you would be able to fill those pits is with a tig welder um, and just <laughs> slightly build it up and then, you know, file it down. So, which probably isn't worth a headache on this gun. These things, even in the best of shape, aren't worth that much money. So, uh, if I were going to do that, I would try to find a new magazine and replace it. I wouldn't want to put this old beater magazine back in the gun, or I wouldn't, need, and I wouldn't bother reblowing it. I might reblow the base plate, but I also don't try to misrepresent the gun as you know in excellent shape if i've re it it's you know it i sell it with that uh disclosed because i think it's kind of sleazy to uh refinish a gun and then not tell anybody somebody new to this to the hobby or collecting it might be fooled and think oh that's a pristine example um so i'll go ahead and slide this one back together it goes pretty quick so i'm going to put my little striker assembly back in there and of course you know it's easy to figure out because you have the firing pin and that obviously has to strike the primer so that just kind of slides in there and then i'm going to put my barrel back in these can get a little interesting sometimes uh because i know i have to rotate it back into place it's it's going to want to go in the gun just like that because this notch where the extractor is uh you know that's that's where the extractor 
flows through. But I can't put it in that way. It won't go back together because it has to rotate back into place. So I know that it's probably going to come in this way. Uh, let me get it back in first. And let's see here. It's always fun, always a puzzle how to do these. And this is the part of the video that I always get trapped figuring something out. Let's try it this way. So I might have to just set this one aside and come back to it. I'm not going to waste 20 minutes of our time reassembling the gun. That's not what the video is about. So, um, but I'm going to take apart this little uh, vest pocket and kind of show you. This is a, a, a much more well-known gun and the procedure for taking it apart is pretty well known to me. It's like the, the vest pocket and the 1903 uh, pocket hammerless, you know, very similar and, you know, share a whole lot of features. So knowing this gun helped me figure out that one. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the scales. And if you haven't noticed, I really like these old pocket guns. Um, I've kind of been obsessed with them the last few months and uh, have been buying them up, mostly at auctions. Uh, some of them have quite a bit of value and some of them uh, have almost no value other than just curiosities. Uh, this little vest pocket is, is reasonably valuable. They're not cheap anymore. Um, it's probably worth six hundred dollars maybe uh, so the scales come off from here um this is interesting because i'm going to put the slide back forward and what you do is it's kind of like a glock where you just kind of grip it this way and slide the, i'm just sliding the slide back a tiny bit it gives me enough room to turn the barrel you'll see it turn here in just a second when i get to right to the sweet spot Right there, see the see the barrel turn. Uh, I don't know, I can't really show it, but the barrel gets that spot and rotates. And when it hits that spot, it just comes right apart. Um, so you can see that that's uh, very similar to the one we just looked at, um, except this one, the guide rod, you know, it has a traditional guide rod and spring to it. And then this is the striker assembly right here. So. It's very, very similar to the one we just looked at, except I suspect that this sear engagement is uh, a little bit different geometry. And you remember that the this had a long straight flat on it up here. So they're not a drop-in replacement. Um, and looking at this gun, sometimes there's also a little pin that goes in the back here. This gun doesn't have it, but that rests against something on the back of the frame here. It's this little raised rounded portion. Um, but what you'll see, I'm gonna see if I can set this one up because this is one I know I can find a part for if I do launch this thing. Uh, so, okay, I can press it back. Let's see here. And right there, see if it'll stay. No, it doesn't want to stay. Now, I was going to try to show you how that, that thing locks itself together and you'll take the slide off and it'll be trapped in there. But any little nudge and bang, it just turns into a rocket ship. Um, but here, once again, the barrel, you know, is, this is where, I don't know if you can see them, but there's little ridges in there that this barrel rotates against. So they're, they're little ridges right inside the frame on this side. So that's how, that's knowing this gun and the uh, pocket hammerless really gave me some nice clues as to where the hidden danger was going to be on that other Browning design. So anyway, that's the vest pocket. Put that one together. Got some guns to put together later tonight. Um, this is an interesting one. This is the most... This is the latest one that I've I got, and it's a Mauser WTP Type 2. So it is actually made by the Mauser company. I had never heard of 
Mauser making these pocket pistols. So when I saw one, I knew I had to have it. I uh, had no idea what the value was or the scarcity or anything about them. So I started reading and this, this is what, when I'm bidding on something like this, um, before I place a bid, I want to get an, an idea of the approximate value of one based on the condition. And then I start looking for parts, you know, are parts available? Is this thing, is it noted to, to be missing anything? Um, you know, if it is missing something, how hard is it to replace that stuff? Well, this one was missing a magazine and, uh, I thought, oh gosh, what are the odds of finding one of these? They they made twenty two thousand of this particular model, um, so guess my guess is that not a lot of them were imported into the U.S. So finding a uh, a magazine for this gun in the U.S. was going to be a bit of a stretch. There is a company called Triple K that remanufactures uh, remanufactures magazines for this. Um, and I found an original magazine in Poland, um, you know, from, from this gun and this model. Uh, and the difference is that it has the Mauser logo stamped in the base plate. So I ordered it because it's, it's correct for this gun. I didn't want to put an aftermarket uh, magazine in it if I could avoid it. So I've ordered one of the Triple K ones and I ordered the one from Poland so that I, my thinking is if the one the triple K one runs, then I'm going to just shoot the gun with that one and then keep the uh, original just to have it. Um, so anyway, um, so I knew I needed a magazine. So I, I went out and verified that I could get one and uh, I in, ended up winning the gun. But if you can look, if you look at it, it looks very, very similar to that vest pocket. Um, and a lot of companies have made, the baby Browning is a, a copy of that gun. Just about any, any and all gun manufacturers of that period in Europe seem to make some variation of that thing. So when you see these, uh, if you're familiar with the vest pocket, it gives you a pretty good idea how to work on them. And uh, there may even be some interchangeability in parts. I don't know. Um, I would suspect more so, but, between the FN guns and the actual brown, um, Colt versions of them, but I, I don't know, so I can't speak to that. But um, so it gives you some idea of how this thing probably is assembled and goes together. Um, it's not an exact copy because we don't have the grip safety back here and, and none of the European ones did that I know of. They might, but the, the uh, FN model doesn't have the, the grip safety back here. Um, and the safety mechanism is different it, on this gun. It's right here in front of the, the grip scale instead of back here. So um, this one was a little more intuitive how to disassemble in my mind, uh, but still it's different enough that I had to kind of approach it with caution. So I usually like to take the scales off just to get a look inside, see what I could see. And uh, start there. If you find one of these uh, cheap in an auction, pick it up. I paid, I think, two and a quarter for this thing because it didn't have a magazine. I think a lot of people were shy uh, for shy of ordering or, you know, bidding on it. And uh, later doing a little bit more research through some of the Luger forums and some of the kind of collector forums, uh, these things were favored by German officers in World War II as just little pocket backup guns. Um, so a lot of them came back to the U.S. as bringbacks, and I suspect that that's what this one is. There's no import markings on it or anything. So I suspect somebody just brought it back from the war. Uh, it's in really good shape. There's a little bit of bluing wear on it, but everything is there and is, is pretty clean. So from here, uh, you know, I wasn't sure exactly what to do. Um, so you just, I start by, you know, assuming that this is the browning design. So I'm gonna go ahead and try rotating the barrel and, you know, can't do that. That didn't work. So I'm looking around and scratching my head thinking, this is a baby browning. How, you know, how the heck did, does it go together? Then I noticed that th there's a little tab right here on the uh, trigger guard. 
And I thought, well, they didn't put it there for no reason. So I was playing around with it and I, and I, I pushed it down. That's really the only way it can go. So I pushed it down and then, you know, started messing around and, uh, you know, the barrel came right off. And I thought, well, that's interesting. How the heck does that work? Um, so once I got it apart, I noticed that it has this rounded hole in it, just like we saw earlier on uh, this gun. Oops, get that out of the way. This is the, the first one we took apart. It had that same kind of system to it, but they used it differently. They're using it here as a takedown versus uh, the other gun using it as part of the charging system. And inside, there's a little round post. And when you push it up, it's high enough to lock into that, that uh, little hole in the guide rod. So that's the only time I've ever seen that done. It's really interesting to me and, and kind of cool. Uh, and it works. I suspect it wouldn't be ideal for a large caliber gun. Would probably wear that out and shear it off pretty quick. But that was pretty cool. So I think they did something like this to avoid patent infringement on the Colt design. I suspect they had to change it a certain amount to make it uh, just different enough. So that was an interesting gun to take apart. Um, this one I had very little information on because there's so few of them. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, documentation on these things. So I just got to go dive in head first and figure it out. But once again, we're looking at a, another striker design. Get it out of here. Let's see. Doesn't want to come out. Barrel, firing pin to move. Slide this out. There it is. So, is it all starting to seem familiar now? You know, you start to learn and pick up on these design features, and um, you know, some of the some of the designs were just so well done. I guess the Browning designs are legendary. That. Um, the more you work on these things, the more intuitive it becomes uh, how, to, how to take them apart and what to look out for. Um, this one, you'll notice it looks a lot like the other two, except this one, the engagement surface is, is a bit longer, and, but it has that flat on the front. Um, so, and then I, I found some poor guy that's looking for one of these and, you know, all of the hundreds of people on that forum and all of the WTP owners, nobody had a spare. So you do not want to launch that across the room. That would be a real pain to try to make or find one. Uh, so that's pretty much it for taking apart the slide on this. Very, very similar to the vest pocket. Um, you know, if you, you know, if you look at them, they're very, very similar. Uh, you can see where they knocked that gun off, you know, copied it. Uh, but what's fascinating about these things to me also from that period is not just the design, but the amount of craftsmanship that went into making this thing. Uh, I don't think you could make them today because of the amount of intricate work that has to be done to put this thing together. And like this little uh takedown button right here is is machined to fit precisely in that hole and there's no gap there it's just absolutely perfectly machined and uh it it just blows my mind that guys did that without automation you know cnc and you know really precise mills and lathes you know they had them but they weren't nearly as good as what we have today and uh, so I, I just love looking at these things and, and just marveling at the craftsmanship and the elegance of how they manufactured this stuff. Like these pieces are all really crisp and just really well made. They're not, of course, this being a German gun, uh, they, tend to, they tend to be that way. You know, they tend to be very precise. Um, another difference is, like I said, the um, safety is up here. 
instead of back here on a baby browning. So, uh, and then we have a spring. I could see the tail of it right up in here. Uh, I, I suspect that you pop these two pins out and your mag release comes out and that this spring is in here to provide tension on that mag release. So uh, make note of that, make note of where the springs are on these things uh, because you do not want to get ambushed by one. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it back together real quick. Uh, are there any questions up to this point? I'm, I'm just babbling on. There are no questions at this point. I have been paying attention and we haven't had any. Uh, Okay, I'm either boring them to death or they're enthralled. Or you're explaining things so well, Scott. Yeah, that I'm there sure are that's no not, questions. I'm sure that's not it. So it just squeezes back together like a normal barrel and guide rod. I actually fell in love with this gun with the, you know, once I figured out the takedown procedure, I fell in love with just how good and precise it is. Uh, so this slides back together. Uh, and I'll admit that the first time I took this apart, that spring went into space. The spring for the the um, striker assembly or the, the firing pin assembly got launched. And I have carpet in my family room and I spent an evening looking for it. I couldn't find it. So I came out here to the shop and I have bags of you know 12 18 inch long pieces of spring of different sizes different type different sizes of wire different coil uh, you know uh, thickness and you know the number of coils per inch so i have a whole lot of spring stock that i can usually come up with a spring make a working spring that will fit this um, and then i also save springs like when i replace them uh, from other guns, I save them and throw them in a bucket uh, or, a, you know, this cookie tin that I have because they can save your life sometimes. Um, but so about the time I got the right spring and if the tension felt right and everything, I got it all back together and I found the original spring, thankfully, because I, I really don't like putting bodged parts in there, but sometimes that's what you have to do. So I put the original spring back in. Um, Get this back together. While you're putting that together, there was a question about the Ruger standard. How does that fall for complexity? Um, have, you, have you have you taken it apart? Have you put one together, even for that matter? You're talking about the the Ruger, like the original Ruger for the Mark series. Um, is that what they're asking? Because I quick, I have I have worked on those uh, and. The learning curve is steep on them, but boy, are they fun. Um, now I can do them pretty easily. Um, but, you know, anybody that's ever taken one apart for the first time uh, will invent words trying to put one back together. One of the earlier early videos I did a couple of years ago for the social distance learning is a Mark II. It's a very similar gun and yeah, took it apart and showed the tricks of how to do it. Um, but they'll make you scream bloody murder trying to figure it out. Uh, it's all about getting the hammer in the right position as you put it all back together. You know, you have to keep kind of moving things around and flipping it over and uh, it, it hits an interesting sequence, but um, they're not that hard once you figure it out. But yeah, you have I, one. I do. I have a Mark II. So I don't that have might be thing. one of the next videos, though, if because people I've had I've owned those. They're horrible. Yeah. I got rid of all of them because I didn't want to deal with it anymore. Well, I already did one a couple of years ago, but I'd be happy to redo it. Um, yeah. You know, some more people. I was looking it. for more ideas. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's back together. And then as far as the magazine went, I didn't want to wait. I, I you know, I had a new toy. Uh, so I went through my stack of old parts and I had some 25 ACP magazines from old retired guns and I dug it out and I did some measurements to figure out, you know, how long it needed to be and, you know, that sort of thing and, and cut it down and played around a little bit with the feed lips and made a working magazine for the gun. It holds one less round than the gun is supposed to, I suspect, because I didn't cut the spring and I think the spring is taking up more room than it should, but I'm not about to go in there and mess with success. 
Um, so it's going to be fine as a five plus one versus a six plus one until the magazine comes in the mail. But anyway, that's one of the little guns that I have had some fun with recently. It turns out to be worth quite a bit of money. I've seen them. I haven't seen one for less than $800 recently in uh, auctions and, and past sales. The uh, WTP version one is, is quite a bit more common than this one. Uh, this is another one that I've worked on recently, this Sour and Sewn uh, uh, 32 ACP. And this is just another example from that period of, you know, another semi-automatic gun and a completely different design for takedown. So with this one, you have to unscrew this back piece. You have to press hey, down so on Scott, Yeah. We have about eight minutes left. Okay. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to hop into that. Uh, depending on how much time that's going to oh, take. Oh, okay. Well, I just wanted to point out that it was just a, I'm not going to take the whole gun down, but just wanted to point out that if you're looking at guns from this period, kind of what to expect. So th this unscrews and to unscrew it, you have to push down on the rear sight um, to let this, it locks into a little uh, space on there. So this is another one where you've got to be careful because you know that this is spring loaded because you have to push down on it. So, I was really touchy unscrewing this because I didn't know how that, if that spring was retained or uh, what was going to happen. So this is kind of the Jack in the box scenario. So I had to kind of keep my hand covering it in case anything flew out. Uh, these are the ones that make me nervous. It's like, to me is like um, taking apart a bomb, <laughs> not quite as dramatic, but anyway, you know, it just comes right apart. Um, like so. And then from here, it's pretty familiar looking, uh, except, you know, this one has a bolt, uh, a little different configuration, but inside there is that striker. Um, so anyway, there's just something to look for. Another hint that you've got a spring somewhere. Turns out all the spring tension is just right here in this flat spring. I thought that there might be uh, another spring or detent or something under there, but there wasn't. So anyway, that's just kind of a, uh, the way I approach taking apart guns that I'm not at all familiar with. Uh, and then kind of how you start to pick up the design cues and patterns of uh, some of this stuff and how it uh, becomes somewhat intuitive to you. So anyway, hope I haven't bored you too much. I know we still have a bunch of people here watching. I don't uh, see any other questions, but I'm going to give everyone a minute in case they're typing something up right now or a few seconds anyway. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing anything yet, um, but thank you, Scott. I'm going to stop the streaming now.